Hello, BookTube. Yesterday, I had an appointment very early in the morning, and it got cancelled. So I didn't end up going to the Brattle Bookshop in downtown Boston. And Mark Richardson saw that opening, and he pounced. <laughs> or whatever the Vermont equivalent of pouncing is, probably moving very deliberately. <laughs> he got into his six-ton bright red truck and went on a mail haul of his own with unbelievable results which you saw yesterday. I will leave I will leave a link to his video down below. And when he was done with that haul, he sat back and he raised a cup of his fancy box wine with his wife, Deb, and he said, that was a great mail haul. And do you know what the best part of it was? And Deb said, what? And he said, no Donahue. And she said, oh man, yes, and that ugly little dog of his. <laughs> and then they cackled late into the night. Because <laughs> it's a rough world in the OGBG book hall wars. <laughs> as you can see from the fact that Sean D. Stampatz is back among us, thank God, and has been doing a, 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 a fantastic book haul over the last few days that considering the last two months he's had is practically posthumous. And he's still doing a better job than either Mark or me. <laughs> and it's only the fact that the Irish government ordered Jason Harrigan into retreat that that is stopping him from beating all of us. <laughs> but that post that appointment was postponed until today. Uh, so I went uh, first thing in the morning. It's still got the gripe of the grip of cold around here. It's that's it's going to break. I feel certain that it's going to break. the The dawn chorus is has all sorts of new voices in it. It's not just the year-round, the hardy year-round sparrows and starlings and whatnot, there are all sorts of, vo of voices, all sorts of birds are here who weren't here a month ago. It will break, it's just, well, I, I, and I hardly expect it to break, you know, at six in the morning. So when all of the rotten stuff was done, I went to the Brattle Bookshop, which is a used bookstore in the heart of Boston, and I got a bunch of books. For those of you who are new to the channel, the Brattle is a great used bookstore. They are turning over their stock all the time, just constantly. They're always out buying. Uh, but in addition to always out buying, they also have a sale lot right next to the building that's vast. It's as big as the floor plan of another building. And it's thousands and thousands of sale books for $1, $3, or $5. So I, uh, I indulged myself. I didn't have a whole lot of time, but I indulged myself, and I got a lot of books. So I want to show them to you. Uh, starting with a whole raft of mass market murder mysteries. Most of the things I got today were a dollar, so I, I wasn't really I wasn't really inconvenienced by the price. Mainly, as I've said many times before, mainly with the Brattle, the thing that stops you is how much you can carry. So I don't I, I, I don't drive. I've never sat behind the wheel of a car in my life, but I have no idea what I would do if I had a car parked around the corner. I don't know how many books I'd get. Uh, but I got a bunch of uh, murder mysteries. The first two are by the same author. And they're part of this Murder, Inc. Uh, imprint that I, I've read a couple of these and liked them. So I, I figured, you know, maybe it's the editors that I'm agreeing with. And I found two murders, or two mur mysteries by the same person I've never heard of before. V.C. Clifton Baddeley. Now, the first one is Only a Matter of Time. And I saw this on the cards and thought that the, this author also wrote a book called My Foe Outstretched Beneath the Tree. And I thought, boy, this sounds fascinating, but would I, wouldn't I wouldn't give to have that one as well. And there it is. <laughs> there it is. It's, I got them both. And they star an amateur detective. Uh, like, for instance, this one, uh, Only a Matter of Time. Uh, on Friday afternoon, the directors of Bexminster Electronics were gathering for a top-secret meeting. And a few miles down the road, inhabitants of King's Lacey, that's the little village, uh, were preparing their annual festival. No one dreamed that the weekend would be shattered by mayhem and murder. Certainly not Dr. Davy, the distinguished poetry professor with a knack for detective work. He had come to the quaint English village in search of diversion and instead found himself hunting something far more dangerous, an industrial spy who was also a cold-blooded killer. And he stars in this as well. Uh, these, these books are noteworthy for having back artwork. Don't usually see that in, in Murder Mysteries. And uh, this one came out in... This was originally published in 1969, so the the high tech stuff going on in Bexminster Electronics is going to be rather wince inducing. But I'll take it. But it, uh, 
things like that are painful enough when you read them about the 1990s, but in the 1969, oh my, everything in the future will be computerized. <laughs> um, this next one is an author I'm very familiar with, but not under this pseudonym. Wasn't even aware, really, that this author wrote under a pseudonym. I kind of thought that the name I know him under was a pseudonym. Uh, this is John Dixon Carr, only writing under the pseudonym of Carter Dixon. And this is a Sir Henry Merivale mystery, the White Priory murders. I think Sir Henry is another amateur. Uh, who the Dickens could murder lovely Marcia Tate, Sir Henry Merivale's favorite cinema sex goddess. An exceedingly rummy business, to be sure. Is she dead or isn't she? Are we sorry she's dead? Or aren't we? Uh, Marcia bludgeoned to death in the Queen's Mirror Pavilion, the 17th century trysting place of King Charles II and Lady Castlemine. Uh, but with one set of footprints in the new fallen snow leading to the pavilion and none leading away, Detective Inspector Humphrey Masters is baffled. Not to worry, though. Sir Henry has the situation well in hand, or so it would appear, until another murder occurs right beneath the portly sleuth's pudgy nose. So the cops are befuddled, but an amateur is on the scene to sort things out. We'll see how that works. Uh, and this next one is a excuse me, he's a murder mystery author I know. Uh, this is Robert Barnard. I've read a, a couple of his books and really liked them. And this is another, it looks like another um, literary type mystery. I guess he must have done quite a few of those. And this is from a, a sequence called Scene of the Crime, which is another imprint that I rather like. This is Death of a Literary Widow. I don't think it gives me much in the way of a description. No, the back is entirely blurbs. I guess by then he was well known. But these were all a dollar, so I'm perfectly willing to take chances. Uh, and can. The neat thing about the Brattle, not just the dollar books, but also the uh, the three and five dollar books, really, when you think about it, is that you can gamble. You can you can spend uh, $30 on an armload of books and and not know anything about them. That's that's fantastic for me. Uh, then this next one is called Casa Madrone. And it's by someone who the book calls rather optimistically America's Agatha Christie. The author's name is Mignon Eberhard. I've never heard of that name. I've, if this were America's Agatha Christie, I would have. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, that, that she doesn't count. I, if we had to guess, I'd say probably Elizabeth George is America's Agatha Christie. But one way or another, uh, this, this is an American thing, which is uh, most of the murder mysteries that I get are set in England. Let's see. Uh, the book ever... The book ever fortune was no more. Gone were the fabulous jewelry, the art collection, and even the heavy silverware. Still, Aunt Flo Bell kept up appearances for the sake of her niece Mallory, and her efforts soon paid off when Richard Welbeck, the young, handsome, fabulously rich San Franciscan, met Mallory and proposed marriage. Then came the news of Richard's mysterious illness and the request of the family taking place on the West Coast. And from that moment on, a deadly shadow followed the young bride. Her aunt's poisonous medicine disappeared and found its way into Mallory's drink. A strange man reached out from the darkness, trying to take her life. Mallory knew that someone wanted to prevent the wedding and was desperate enough to resort to murder, but she was not prepared for the shocking revelation that awaited her arrival. Okay, so no idea who the, who the sleuth is. I, from, that, uh, from that plot description, I am guessing that Mallory herself is the killer, but we shall see. Uh, the ultimate spoiler, if I could get that from the copy cover. Uh, and then this, oh, this next one's got a little schmutz on the cover, but that's all right. I don't know any of these people. Uh, most of these of these names I don't know. Don't know anything about them. They could be institutions. I still wouldn't know. This, uh, can't really imagine what attracted me to this one. It's called In the Death of a Man by Leslie Egan. An errant husband finds himself at murder's door. That is the cover. Looks more like suicide than murder, but uh, I, I always appreciate the original artwork here. When blonde, wealthy Lynette Lester first sought Jesse Falkenstein's help, he didn't want to get involved. He was a lawyer, not a private detective, and philandering husbands just weren't his line. Then Lynette's frantic phone call came from the police station. She was no longer concerned with her unfaithful husband. It was too late. Glenn Lester was dead. And homicide was Jesse Falconine's, Jesse Falconine's business. Not really. <laughs> Litigating homicide is his business. If he's a lawyer, not a cop, then it's not his business. But one way or another, it looks like I got a bumper crop of amateurs. Of amateur sleuths. We'll see. We'll see what they... I pop these things right down. I'm in between, you know, other books, I just pop them down. And uh, 
strongly, I'm strongly coming to think that I could write one of these myself. If I was only better at plotting, it might be a good idea to get a co-author who's good at plotting. <laughs> Uh, then this next one is a UK mass market paperback. Uh, this is an author that I already have, but I, it's always nice to have a little mass market to stick in a pocket somewhere. This is Daydreams and Other Stories by the great Frank O'Connor in a pan trade uh, mass market paperback. Frank O'Connor, one, one of the great uh, masters of the Irish short story, uh, hoping that maybe whoever dumped this at the Brattle dumped a whole bunch of other stuff. That would, that would be great. He was prolific, and I don't have everything. I don't have even a fraction. Uh, so, uh, in the stories in here, it'll be neat to see them separated from the big collected short story volume. Uh, it'll be neat to see them separate from that. Uh, a lot of times when that happens, it's, things stand out. You know, when you have a big collection of short stories by somebody, whether it's Cheever or Flannery O'Connor or Eudora Welty or whatever, you tend to read in that collection. And that can dull the strangeness of each individual story. So, we shall see. Uh, then these next few mass market paperbacks are all the same author. <laughs> they are all they're all the same author in two different editions. This is Anthony Pohl, and this is his great work, A Dance to the Music of Time, which went on forever. It's a gigantic multi-volume series uh, that follows a small cast of characters, including one immortal character, uh, through the whole 20th century, all of it that Pohl knew or cared anything about. And it was issued book by book. Slim novel by slim novel, I think like 10 of them, something like that. And then those came out in, in, in many, many mass market editions. And one of the series of mass market editions was by the popular library. Uh, all individual, all numbered. They look like this on the shelf, these tiny little things. And all with this original artwork. Who is the artwork? Who does the artwork? Does it say... No, it does not. Uh, but the, they all had this. We've got the photographic background. There's a photograph of flowers and a, and a, a tablecloth. And then an inset illustration for each of the individual books. There you have two of the main characters, and sitting prim and proper in the middle is Wilson Shugart. Uh, and this is book number one. Uh, and <laughs> I have long been meaning to reread A Dance to the Music of Time, the whole thing. I have been meaning to do that for probably 20 years, and the whole thing that has stopped me, really, is not having the right edition. I haven't been in love with any of the editions of this series that have come out, that I've seen. What I really want is a, a series of Penguin Black Spine trade paperbacks, one per book, that is then released in a box. In a box set. As far as I know, there's never been anything like that. So it's take, it, you know, it's catch as catch can. I saw this one. I would never have got another volume in this, uh, in this set. Uh, although the, the cover drawing for Casanova's Chinese Restaurant, which I think is volume three or four, is quite good. <laughs> it's, it's quite good. It's quite a good cover. Uh, but I would never have gotten one volume like this if it hadn't been volume one. So that's why I got this one. Because if I am overcome, in 2021 with the desire that this is going to be the year when I reread A Dance in the Music of Time, then, the, you know, I can start with Volume 1. There's no there's no rule against it. There was, there was a set of these books that I did like. It was a little bit delicate, but I can reinforce them. And they're mass market paperbacks. I'd rather not do deal with mass market paperbacks for, you know, 3,000 3, pages, but nevertheless, there was a mass market set that I liked. I had it once upon a time, I sent it away to somebody, and just waited for the Brattle to provide. I shouldn't do that anymore, because as I've mentioned on this channel, even a bookstore as good as the Brattle is not going to keep providing mass market paperbacks. These things aren't made anymore. They aren't updated anymore. Nothing like that. So, especially not actual literature, as opposed to, like, you know, Star Wars or something like that. Meaning these things have a limited supply. A lot of them get thrown in, munici in municipal dumps every year. They're not circulating anymore. And that means they're less likely to appear. The Brattle is less likely to, provi to provide. And yet, today, I found almost the whole of the set that I'm talking about. Also from Popular Library. They also bound them together in big mass market collections. I found two, three, and four 
I did not find volume one in this series. Now, is that because the person who dumped this at the Brattle uh, put it in a separate box and it'll be coming up from the basement and getting priced in due time? Or is it because somebody was going through the Brattle sale lot and thought, well, I don't know if I want to commit to four big volumes, but I'll try the first one. In which case, this is, a, this is an infamous broken set. But the thing about these things, like, for instance, here's uh, Volume 2. These have multiple novels in them. So Volume 2 has At Lady Molly's, Casanova's Chinese Restaurant, and The Kindly Ones. Since I don't have Volume 1 in this series, and since I have A Question of Upbringing, which is the very first book in the series, the only two books in the series that I'm currently missing are Buyer's Market and what is widely regarded as one of the best books in the series, The Acceptance World. I don't have either one of those two, but this has, each of these volumes has three separate little books in it and a themed cover. And the themed cover has one of these gate folds and it has a picture that uh, folds out. A picture that, fold, uh, that folds out of the season in question. So a kind of a, Kind of a dorky design choice. I don't know that I would have done it, but uh, but one way or another, it is possible to reinforce these things, and these are the ones I like. I don't think these ever came in a box. These, This is the set that I like, but I'm now missing one volume. So I need volume one in this series. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, this next one is a book that I love. It's an author I love. He's out of print. He will always be out of print. He's long gone. I've had this book. This is actually my favorite of all of his novels. He wrote some nonfiction that I really wish I could get my hands on. Uh, once upon a time, he was extremely popular. We talked about that with Mary Johnston. And, there, you know, we go on and on. We talked about it with, uh, with Oppenheimer as well. That you could go on and on. These authors who were absolute mainstays of the bookstores and are now completely forgotten. This uh, is Joseph Lincoln. And this is his novel, The Rise of Roscoe Payne. Which the Brattle, I, I, somebody gave this to them with the dust jacket on it, and they put one of these library uh, uh, plastic sheets on it as well. So it's well protected, and that is great. That is just fantastic. Uh, Joseph Lincoln was a Cape Cod author uh, 130, 140 years ago. He was a Cape Cod author who decided to, tell, to make the Cape into a kind of Eden into a kind of pre-lapsarian wonderland where people were quirky and funny and where the modern world had not intruded. Uh, it was already making inroads into the vineyard even when he was writing these books, and he knew perfectly well what other people were writing, like uh, up here, Theodore Dreiser. Uh, he knew perfectly well that this was against the bent of serious literature in America. Serious literature in America was tending towards the grim and gritty. And he didn't want to write that. He didn't want to write that. He wanted to write about a, a, a Shangri-La called Cape Cod. Uh, little did he know that not only would Cape Cod continue modernizing, but that it would continue being used as a, a sort of Shangri-La, that people would continue to characterize it that way, even as it got more modern. Uh, that's, I firmly believe, why most people go to Cape Cod, to for the feel of, get, of, of getting away from the rest of the world, a uh, feeling that is only exaggerated when you go offshore to Martha's Vineyard, and even more so when you go further out to Nantucket. Uh, this is the story of a young man named Roscoe Payne, I, I, who falls in love, meets a cantankerous neighbor, and falls in love with a daughter. And it's a charming, delightful story. And here it is in in a hardcover with a with a dust jacket that is well protected, ready to be reread. This is an author. This author, I would love to have a whole shelf of his books. That's for sure. Uh, just to re, to revisit all of them, and maybe maybe this is a harbinger. Maybe whoever got rid of this will get rid of others. Uh, that'd be great because he's a delight. His books are delightful. They never fail to put a smile on your face. Uh, then we have, uh, this is a hardcover. It's something that I've had before many times. I always end up sending it away, but I'm pretty sure I don't have it at the moment. The nice thing about uh, books at the Brattle being a dollar is that you don't have to worry all that much about whether or not you have it. Because if you do, you haven't spent a whole lot of money. Uh, this is talking about detective fiction by the great diminutive P.D. James, the great mystery author P.D. James. And this is just her her thoughts, her dissertation on uh, on her craft. I have an ebook of this, I believe, and I've had trade paperbacks of this before, and I might have one here now, but it's March Mystery Madness, all throughout the month of March. A whole bunch of great booktubers are singing the praises of murder mysteries and wanting you to read them and read about them. And this is 
uh, takes its place on the shelf of any collection of books about murder mysteries. Uh, then we have two books uh, by the same author. <laughs> this is the first one is Changing Tides. These are this is by Michael Thomas Ford, and then the next one is The Road Home, in which a character has an accident uh, and is forced to go home to his small town in Vermont where he meets an alluringly sexy local librarian who helps him out with a piece of family research. Proving, I think, rather definitively that this is science fiction. <laughs> this, this, as you can tell from the covers, this is gay fiction. Uh, Michael Thomas Ford wrote, uh, uh, 10 years ago, he wrote uh, gay nonfiction, gay young adult stuff, and also a series of very well-regarded gay romance novels, adult gay romances in which his characters are quippy and funny and there's a whole lot of heart and they find love and sometimes it's not what they expect. Uh, and it wasn't, there weren't too many examples of this kind of thing on the market. There weren't too many examples of gay fiction at the time where the, the gay protagonists were not warped in some way by oppression or social pressure or whatever. The, these are not uh, hysterically vamping drag queens or anything like that. These are just ordinary people. They're, they're, they have bank balances. They have normal jobs. They want to fall in love. They want to get a house with a white picket fence, that sort of thing. It's not an endless stream of, of screaming harpies or meth-fueled dance boys that, that was so much of what you had to put up with in so-called gay literature if you were to read it. it it's not that. Instead, it's just ordinary people. And uh, the, the uh, people that designed these books for Kensington Press made the inspired decision to give every one of his books a Steve Walker cover. I wonder if we have a gallery uh, of more of those. Do we have a gallery? Yeah, okay. Well, there's a, there's a bunch right there. Um, Steve Walker is uh, taken too soon from us and is, uh, was, a, uh, was a gay artist who... I mean, yes, all of his of his models are very good looking. They are very well built young men. They have muscles and hair and smiles and whatnot. Uh, but he very much went along the same lines of, despite that aesthetic hook, he gives you very normal scenarios in his paintings. His paintings are remarkably touching. Just uh, young men talking to each other, grieving with each other, uh, being nervous, hanging out daydreaming and it was an inspired decision to give all of michael thomas ford's books steve walker covers not just because they're extremely aesthetically appealing but also because they uh uh they reflect what's going on in his books where it's just ordinary people who are who are encountering troubles and maybe love uh and the, his his author description says uh, he's an award winning author of numerous books, including the popular Trail, Trials of My Queer Life series of essay collections. One of which is Alec. The first one I think was called Alec Baldwin Doesn't Love Me, uh, and a series of essay collections on the novels Last Summer, Looking for It, Full Circle, and Tangled Sheets. He lives in San Francisco with his partner and three very bad dogs, and these are all from the uh, early two thousands, I believe. Uh, yeah, this is from two thousand seven. And The Road Home, about the sexy Vermont librarian, <laughs> is from 2010. Uh, and I can tell you, <laughs> and I don't know about these three very bad dogs, but when Michael Thomas Ford lived here in my neighborhood, 20 years ago, more than that, when he was just a boy, he had only one dog. And that dog was enormous and a very good boy. He was not a bad dog in any way. <laughs> not in any way. And he was fascinating. Fascinating and sassy. Uh, even then. Uh, before fame found him. It, uh, fascinating to listen to him talk about writing. Fascinating to talk books with him. On dog walks. Uh, where he had a big, enormous, wonderful dog. And my dog at the time was a, a beagle. I think there are two of you watching these videos who actually knew him. And if you think back on him, you will remember quite accurately that he did not care about any living thing on Earth except me. None. None of the other beagles that ended up being in his household. No other dogs, no other human beings, no cats, no chipmunks, no squirrels, no nothing. He didn't care about anything that lived but me. 
we were best friends. Uh, and so nights walking with this particular author were just a long protracted session of my dog ignoring his dog. <laughs> um, anyway, anyway, this next one's a huge work of history uh, that I have been meaning to revisit. And I confess, uh, as is always the case here, uh, there's a booktube element. Because uh, Bill Rutenberg at the Rutenberg Library, a big fan of the American Civil War, has lots of, uh, you know, like everybody else, he's at the mercy of what kinds of secondhand shops are around him. You can always shop online, but nobody really likes doing that. <laughs> and and uh, he's willing to, to try anything, including a lot of the really old standards for Civil War literature that, that, for instance, I had read years and years ago and then sort of thought I could live without, sort of didn't think about it anymore. And this, I don't think I've, I don't know that I've ever seen this on his channel, but this is very much an example of that kind of thing. I read this trilogy when it first came out and then disregarded it. And now I'm thinking maybe I should reread it. Maybe I should give it another try. This is Lee's Lieutenants uh, by Douglas Southall Freeman, the great biographer Douglas Southall Freeman. Uh, and this is volume one. And it, it's a series of interconnecting bio, biographical studies of the men who commanded the confederate forces so the title's a bit of an of a misnomer in this first volume this first volume goes to uh, from manassas to malvern hill so lee would not have been in charge this is albert Sidney johnson and beauregard and all that sort of thing and it's their rise and fall it's their moments of glory and their idiotic decisions and this is only volume one it's a huge thing and i once upon a time had these three i now need to be on the lookout for volumes two and three and i will read the whole of the trilogy once i get them uh I remember from these and also from other stuff that Douglas Southall Freeman has written that he is uh, way too kind to the Confederacy, way too indulgent to the South. Uh, it's one thing to talk about tactics and strategy, but you shouldn't forget these men were engaged in treason. They may, they may have had plumes in their hats, but they deserved a firing squad, and most especially the arch-traitor Robert E. Lee, who didn't just betray his country, but led armies against it, bled it dry with tens and tens of thousands of casualties that would not be dead if not for him. It's, it's Lee who should have very courtly, very dignifiedly signed the Articles of Surrender at Appomattox Courthouse and then said, I thank you, General Grant, for your gentlemanly disposition. At which point Grant should have said, thanks very much for your signature, and then turned to his men and said, drag him outside and lay him on the ground cut out his tongue, the one that swore an oath to the United States of America, and throw it in the nearest fire, and then hang him from the tallest branch of the tallest tree. And don't do all that good a job. I want him to be an hour dying, and I want him to do it in front of his men. But first, cut out his tongue and burn it, because he took the same oath I did. He took it at West Point, and then he took it when, when we went to Mexico, and then he took it when he became... <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Anyway, I don't subscribe to the plumed feather, you know, uh, George Pettigrew type, aren't we all brave bravos in a doomed cause type attitude that this author often trots out, if I remember correctly. But maybe I don't remember that correctly. It's been a long time since I read Lee's Lieutenants. What I need to do is get the other two volumes. Ideally, it'd, I mean, this will do just fine because it was dirt cheap, but ideally what I'd want probably would be a box set. I love me, my box sets. <laughs> uh, this next one is old. Uh, this is this is uh, the type of thing that happens at the Brattle, where you, you can easily get a book that's 150 years old. Uh, 1921. This is from 1921, and it's Notes and Reviews by Henry James. No, no dust jacket. This probably came in a series. Uh, and it is uh, the very earliest, most of the very earliest printed work by Henry James, who got his start, as virtually every other person of letters did in the entire American canon, writing book reviews. Uh Sometimes under pen names, sometimes anonymously, and then eventually under his own name. And they they were done for money. They were done for review copies. They were done for the thrill of the byline. The first time that Henry James's miserly, tiny little black heart ever leaped for joy at seeing his own name in a printed periodical, it was under a book review. Not not one of his huge, boring novels. <laughs> so, And I have the uh, Library of America volume of... Uh, essays and stuff of Henry James, but I saw this thing, it was dirt cheap, and I wondered if everything that's in that volume is in this. I'm, I wasn't 100% sure, so I added it to the pile, just, just to be sure. 
Uh, this next one is, is something that is full circle here on this channel. We have seen it before. <laughs> uh, this channel is old enough now so that I get books, I haul them, I talk about them with you. One of you puts your hand up and says, I'd really like you to send that to me. I do, and then I need to wait and get the thing again. And that happened with this one. I'm just very glad that, uh, that I got another chance. And this is The Walking Drum by Louis L'Amour. Uh, but once again, somebody uh, took care of this thing. It's, it's in battered condition, but somebody put it in one of these library things so that I don't have to worry about it. I can, I can read it uh, to a fairly well. I got a hardcover copy of this a while ago, years ago on this channel, and showed it to you, talked about it a bit, and then got rid of it. Uh, and this, is, this was Louis L'Amour's follow-up to a big standalone histor ambitious historical novel of his called The Lonesome Gods that was tr really effective, a really effective book. Very, it would be very nice for me to find a hardcover or a mass market paperback of The Lonesome Gods. That would be great. The mass market paperback, I seem to remember, from the 1980s, had a rather memorable cover. Uh, but this was his follow-up, and it is not, as you might be able to tell from the cover, it's not a Western. It's a crusade novel. It's a historical novel. Now, Louis L'Amour, as you know, if you've watched Mark Richardson's channel, for instance, you'll know already that Louis L'Amour, if you're thinking of him off the top of your head, is just a one-note Western writer who didn't have anything else in his brain. You would be wrong. He was a, a dedicated bookman and a, a dedicated student of history. Could probably have written a big and equally convincing historical novel like this one on, on half a dozen historical periods or people. And predictably enough, this is my favorite book of his. Although I'm not sure that if I reread Lonesome Gods, I'm not. I think they make a one-two punch like crazy. And somebody got rid of this. There were no other Louis L'Amour novels at the Brattle today, so I'm thinking that it's a one-off. I don't think I'll see The Lonesome Gods. Uh, but that's all right. I haven't reread this in, since I got that original volume four years ago on this channel, so I'm happy to read it again. Uh, then a work of history, something that I got when it uh, from the publisher when it came out. In uh, 2009, I got the advanced copy, I got the finished copy, I reviewed it, uh, then I got rid of it. And in the years since, I've looked back and thought, no, you don't want to get rid of that, it was really good. It's this, it's a country of vast designs. And there is himself, that is President Polk, and it's really good on Jim Polk. It's really the best book that I've read on him. Uh, but it's everybody else, too. It's the, This is, those of you maybe who don't know your, your American presidents or who aren't familiar with President Polk, uh, he only had one term, but he was incredibly pivotal because the country was twice as big when he left office as when he came into office, and it stretched from one, step, from one coast to the next. It was a radically different America that he helped to create. Uh, and this has all the big personalities that are in his story. It's uh, Robert Mary is a terrific, terrific historian. Uh, this is a, a volume of American history that I'd very much want to keep. And you'd never know that because I didn't. <laughs> but but uh, I checked. This is not my volume. Uh, so somebody else had to get rid of this as well. I'm going to try not to get rid of it again. <laughs> and I'm going to reread chunks of it, especially since uh, it's not Polk. Who is it? Is it Sam Houston? There's a figure right from this time period. It's not Andrew Jackson, but there's a figure right from this time period who's getting a big book later in the year. I'm going to want this. That was the reason I thought of it. I thought about this before I saw it at the Brattle, because that I'm going to want something. Uh, then we have uh, a classic uh, that I was just... I have it, and I think a Penguin classic, but I was just waiting for a nice hardcover, for a hardcover that will go as a compliment to the Penguin classic and be the kind of volume that is aesthetically pleasing to read. And it's this. It's Sarah Orne Jewett. This is The Country of the Pointed Furs, only in this lovely hardcover from W.W. W. Norton from 60 years ago, or whatever, with illustrations by uh, Shirley Burke that are, sometimes they spread over a couple of pages, sometimes they're just um, uh, one page. And this is this is uh, Stories of Rural Maine, and I, I think it's a terrific book. I don't think I would esteem it quite so highly if it weren't for my friend Deb, who really likes it. It likes it enough to make me uh, revisit it. Uh, I I believe I've also lamented in the past on this channel that uh, Sarah Orne Jewett's occasional writing, her book reviews, I don't think are collected. She was another example where the very first thing she ever saw under her own name was a book review. And yet, I don't know that those are even collected. I don't know where you'd find them. Uh, and then, then we'll get to the last book, believe it or not, on this, on this, huge, this huge battle hall, uh, which is the only book, I think, 
that you, some of you have noticed, many of you have emailed me, that Mark Richardson and I are out and about. We are out and about getting books. <laughs> we're doing it as for fun, of course. We're both diehard book haulers. Uh, but also, there's a certain amount of pleasure in uh, in giving you the vicarious thrill. A lot of you don't have near near access to bookstores or whatnot. And some of you have been very kind to say that you really like our commentary on the books as we get them. And there's also a tiny bit of competition. <laughs> a tiny bit. I'm way behind. Especially with that haul he did yesterday. I'm way behind. That Reader's Digest came mutiny. had me salivating. And one of the goals, <laughs> when, you have a little, when you have a little competition going is to try to make the other person go, oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's the one I want. And I think this one will do the trick. I certainly made that sound because I haven't read this in 50, 30 years, and I, I want to do it again. This is uh, Enjoy Still Felt, the big second volume in the autobiography of Isaac Asimov. Uh, I don't know that Mark has any of these volumes. <laughs> well, probably he does. He has tons and tons of books. But Asimov started out on this project of writing his autobiography in multiple volumes, all of which are 1,200 pages long. For, this is the second volume. In which, as he puts it in his introduction, this is the volume in which he achieved the full measure of greatness that he thought was due to him. <laughs> You're reading it thinking, okay, all right, that's awful egotistical, but then again, you are Isaac Asimov. <laughs> so, so I guess uh, the, the first volume didn't really intrigue me. The, you know, here's the, the shoestring that I came to America with and all that sort of thing. Here's the, the, the apple core of the first apple that I sold for half a penny or whatever. Uh, this is the, the arc of his, of uh, where his career took off and he actually became the Isaac Asimov figure that is known in science fiction fact and legend. <laughs> this is where, this is a book that, if I remember correctly, is full of all the stories about publishing deals and uh, other writers conventions, all that sort of thing. And it is the least uh, vainglorious of them all. The, the project is a little bit vainglorious just to start with. But but uh, first volume, I, I'm not interested in baby Isaac strangling snakes in his cradle like little baby Hercules. And the the I think there was a volume and maybe two after this one that is just the author basking in his own greatness. But here the greatness is achieved. It has to be achieved here. And Asimov takes the great approach throughout all of these volumes of writing him like his fiction. The dialogue is reproduced as dialogue. The character sketches read like character sketches in his fiction. Tremendously enjoyable. And I think it's probably, probably we, we could agree that it's permissible for you to be a little bit overweeningly egotistical in your own autobiography. I think that's probably a little bit permissible, right? I, I, there's only one Isaac Asimov. I'm, I'm willing to grant it to him. Probably this will grate against me a lot less than it did the first time I read it, so I was very happy to find it. Again, don't know if the person who dumped this will dump the other volumes. Not sure that I want them, either. Uh, but anyway, that is the uh, the mail hall. Or not the mail hall. That is the Brattle Book Hall for today. Not sure that even I can do a Steve Pyramid here, but we're going to give it a try. So we have Isaac Asimov's uh, Volume 2 of his autobiography. We have In the Country of Pondered Furs by Sarah Orndewitt, uh, with illustrations. A nice, pretty, a pretty edition here. We have A uh, Country of Vast Design, which is mainly about President Polk and the changes to America under his one administration. We have uh, uh, The Walking Drum, Louis L'Amour's, uh, uh, one of Louis L'Amour's non-Western historical novels. We have Notes and Reviews by a young, sideburned Henry James. Uh, we have Lee's Lieutenants, Volume 1, uh, when Lee was not in charge. We have The Road Home and Changing Tides by Ma Tom Michael Thomas Ford. Uh, who used to be a local boy and is now in San Francisco. I haven't written in a long time either. Ten years. We have Talking About Detective Fiction by P.D. James. <laughs> and, and, well, <laughs> and we have The Rise of Roscoe Payne. Those are the hardcovers. The hardcovers are just barely... They, they just barely made it. And they're going to go careening to the floor here. Uh, so no, a Steve Pyramid is not possible. But then we have uh, lots of Anthony Pohl and lots of Murder Mysteries. And a little Frank O'Connor thrown in there just for uh, Irish seasoning. <laughs> so, so that was a that was a fairly big book haul. <laughs> and believe it or not, and I know some of you will believe this. I, I looking back on my that visit to the Brattle, I'm thinking, yeah, I could have got more. There are other things I would have been willing to try. I just couldn't carry anymore. That's all. The, uh, the, I had a bag and a tote bag full. I couldn't carry anymore, so I had to stop. <sighs> 
Uh, but maybe I'll go back. You never know. It's a writing-heavy week, but maybe I'll go back. It's a writing-heavy week, and that disinclines me, but it looks from the weather forecast like the weather is just going to get progressively warmer. And that inclines me. <laughs> so who knows what will win out one way or another. I will wrap this up, and I will let you know. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.